What's up, y'all? This is Ocast, episode four. Before we get started, I got a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, tomorrow is going to be the record hotness VIP jam. Uh, you can reserve your uh, space as a guest if you want to do that uh, by supporting Owen Adams Music on Patreon. Um, there's a bunch of other cool stuff on there. I'm going to do a whole video about that later, explaining the tiers and the breakdown and how all that works. But for today, we're going to kick off the number one Bible-based music podcast on the planet. My name is Owen Adams. And I'm Connor McTighe. So what are we talking about today, Connor? All right. So today, the biblical reference that we are going to jettison this podcast with is going to be the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, So for those of you that don't know, um, in the early days of the Bible in Genesis, um, two of God's first towns in the whole grand design, grand scheme of things, were Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, early people hadn't really figured out the whole morals thing yet. So uh, it was basically a bunch of people engaging in a lot of uh, um, very, very risque and uh, filth based sexual acts. Uh, they were horrible towns. God was not happy with the lifestyle that these people were living. It's a very nice YouTube appropriate way of describing it. I'm doing my it. best here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for, in order for me to go into detail, it would not be YouTube appropriate. Uh, so God basically put them up for review. Uh, the way that he did so was by sending two of his angels down uh, disguised as uh, beautiful beings, beautiful humanoids, and... Um, he sends them down to the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. They scout about the towns. And because of these, the horribly depraved citizens of each of these towns, uh, all of them wanted to fornicate with the angels. So the angels were continuously running from the people of both towns until they finally came across uh, a gentleman named Lot. Um, Lot was a local farmer. I mean, support your local farms, people, am I right? Um, he was a local farmer with two daughters, and he was the first person that the angels ran across that uh, did that he he was not trying to fornicate with them, nor were his family members. Uh, he was merely trying to uh, put them up and keep them out of harm's way from the inevitable forced sex that the uh, the townspeople of Sodom and Gomorrah were going to have with those two angels. Um, so the angels, they obviously had a report that they had to give back to God and the report they gave back was thus, uh, yeah, I know that, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are both up for annihilation. I'm completely on board with you. Definitely annihilate both of these towns. <laughs> However, uh, this guy lot, he's the only guy who's looked out for us. Uh, we should save him and his family. So God sent the me- the angels a message, and the angels delivered the message thusly to Lot that uh, pack up all your stuff, grab your family, and get out of town. Don't look back either. Do not look back. Bad things will happen if you look back. His wife looked back on their way, running away from the burning wreckage of the town that they had once lived in, and uh, she was instantly turned into a pillar of salt. Um... So it just goes to show you, uh, when when you're given when you're when you're thrown an oar and uh, your your canoe is going off course, uh, don't don't be smirch the face of the person who threw you the oar. Um, so that being said, we are I, I decided to link this rather funly to um, the story of a uh, the notorious B.I.G meeting with uh, Sean Puffy Combs. So uh, Biggie met with Puffy when he decided that he wanted to get out of the streets because he was a well-known drug dealer in his neighborhood in Brooklyn at the time. 
Um, but at the same time, his mixtape was amazing, amazingly lyrically sound. And uh, once Puffy heard him for the first time, he instantly signed him. Um, when he was about to come out with his his main breakout album, when he was actually really about to make it big, uh, he found out that uh, his girlfriend and longtime lover was pregnant with what was going to be his firstborn child. And in order to more quickly uh, get some get some fundage for his new family, he went back to selling drugs for a brief period of time until Puff Daddy came to him and, and found out and said that um, he needed to drop the drug game immediately and not look back. Kind of like Lot's wife. That's where that's where I came up with a little correlation there. Um, and the reason that Puffy stated was because <clears throat> he was he was already going to get reap all of the benefits that his hard work had, you know, given him. Um, so that's just the brief correlation right there. And we're gonna dive into it a little bit more today. Of course. So the episode title today is How to Save Your Music Career. And, of course, in the thumbnail it says, don't look back. And so, like Connor was talking about, um, we're, we're getting into uh, the story of, of Biggie Smalls. Um, so, what does this have to do with saving your music career? And, and I guess, more importantly, for the world's number one Bible-based music podcast, what does this have to do with the story of Lot? Uh, so, the, the first thing we want to make a note of here, uh, as far as Lot goes is he's really not a special guy. You know, uh, God didn't just come down and say, oh, here's Lot. He's the most holy guy. He's the most special guy. And so we have to save him. He's really, you know, probably a sinner, probably uh, engaged. Definitely a sinner, of course. (laughs) You know, he he was living there for a reason in the first place. You got to think, if this guy was so, like, righteous and perfect, why would he pick uh, that that kind of place to live and, and raise his family? Um, so it's just interesting to me when we were doing the research for this, we found that uh, there's really no- nothing special about the guy other than how he reacted and responded in the moment uh, when the angels came to him. And so he, he wasn't really uh, like like getting this big head about, oh, the angels and oh, I'm so special. He treated it like he would treat any other person or he treated them like he would treat any other person. Uh, and because he was kind to them, because he offered them hospitality in that moment, uh, that's what, uh, I guess, gave God the impetus to save this guy. So it, it's not about being perfect. You know, it, it, it's not about being afraid to make mistakes and get something wrong. It's all about how you act in the situation. And um, so uh, what, what I have here is uh, the article uh, which kind of gives us some more details on the Biggie Smalls angle as well. Um, having a little bit of a hard time getting my Zoom to zoom in properly. Did you have anything uh, else you wanted to say about Lot uh, specifically as we transition uh, into the Biggie Smalls? The only Smalls thing that I will say, topic. only because it it, uh, it definitely pertains to the uh, to the Biggie Smalls thing as well, is that uh, it really represents the um, the the concept of um, progress, not perfection so lot was not necessarily special however considering his peers in sodom and in 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 the towns that he that in the town that he lived in the town that he was adjacent to yeah he was looking a lot better so (laughs) it it gave it gave god a little bit of hope uh in 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 the same fashion uh the notorious big going back to selling drugs uh so that he could make ends meet it was what he knew but he was also trying to get away from that and him dropping it as soon as Puffy said, listen, don't don't worry about this. We're going to make sure that your family's taken care of. It was the same thing. Like he was not he was not judged because he went back to his old game. It was seen as progress, not perfection. Yeah, I love that idea of progress. Um, and then also the element of, of not looking back, because if you take a lot. Uh, as he's escaping, right, uh, there's all this destruction and explosions and fire and brimstone, all kinds of carnage going on uh, to, uh, behind him. And 
But don't look at it or you'll turn into a pillar. So you'll, you'll turn into a pillar of salt. Exactly. Don't look. And you know, his wife unfortunately was looked and, and turned into salt. Uh, but but he he still didn't look back. So this entire time he has this trust and this sort of faith that uh, as he keeps moving forward. He's going to be okay. He's going to be protected. He's going to be on the right path. And I think that's such a perfect correlation to the Biggie story um, because uh, similarly, Biggie chose to not look back as he moved kind of uh, up and out of his sort of former street life. Right. Uh, he refused to look back. He, he, he was not <laughs> turned into salt. I guess if you're in the drug dealing business, you'd be turned into something else pretty quickly. <laughs> um, a pillar of who knows what spice. Yeah, what kind of spice. Uh, so there you go. Uh, well, so there's a lot, um, you know, and, and, and we, we had a couple other uh, points written down here. Uh, God had plenty of chances to change his mind on lot. Um, and this goes back to, again, being being in the right mindset and, and staying committed in the moment, in the situation. OK, so he could have, you know, messed it up for himself at a lot of different points. There was a point uh, uh, when we were reading the, the uh, Bible story when he, you know, he offers up his, his daughters in place of the angels. And so every little thing that this guy did. Uh, I guess was viewed as like a valiant effort, and I think that's important. That even though he was giving up his daughters, which is it's like it's like all right, a little backwards, but well, I guess it, like in God's eyes, it's like the lesser of two evils or or something to that effect. So he was. Basically, we're here to retell the Bible, not necessarily make sense of it. <laughs> well, I, I'm just saying that that he he was trying to do what he thought was right in that moment. And he was not questioning it. He was like, okay, I'm going to protect these guys. I'm going to go with my gut feeling, and we're going to see what happens. And he could have been wiped out at any point, like we said. Um, you know, he continually took action, and th that's yes. that's what's important. Um, and then last but not least here, uh, uh, with the looking back, you know, you got to consider uh, your entire city is being leveled and totally destroyed, wiped off of the uh, face of the earth like a nuclear bomb going off. And so he still didn't look back, even though this was like the worst possible imaginable situation that he could have been in. Still didn't look back because otherwise he would have lost his opportunity to start over. There you go. There you go. And so he, he would have been like his wife frozen in place in this salt. He would have been stuck, you know, always wondering what could have been a or beautiful what statue, have been. much like the thumbnail art. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> And that's that's some nice thumbnail art, if I do say so myself. Um, and so there you go. Uh, so that's that's lot. Um, and what we're gonna try to do here is draw some more parallels um, with Biggie Smalls, and I guess in the rap game, but even broader than that, in the music game, the music career game, uh, in general. And what kind of lessons can we learn from this? Uh, so did you have anything else on lot specifically? Not on not anything on lot. Nope, nope. Let's let, let's move it along. There we go. So here we go. We're gonna take a look over here at our beautiful, lovely uh, screen capture, which is right here, and right here, <laughs> as I was just saying. Um, uh -huh. So here's a biography, um, and there's probably a billion of these. You can get a bunch of different info on the Biggie Smalls story. Now, we're not getting into a bunch of conspiracy theories here. We're dealing with facts. We're dealing with uh, uh, what has been documented. Um, so Christopher Wallace, of course, uh, uh, Biggie's real name. Uh, we're going to skip ahead here a little bit um, just, just to kind of paint the picture. Um, he, you know, he's, a, he's a really large guy, really tall guy. Um, you know, it says, it says, uh, he styled himself as a gangster. And although he was no angel in reality, he was more of a performer than a hardened criminal. So right here, you have kind of a little peek at, at what his future was going to hold. He's doing this, this thing that he has to do to get his money in this environment that he's in. And he's trying to do whatever he can to kind of evolve and grow beyond that. So that he could focus on his music and his uh, performance, um, and of course, uh, Bad Boy Records is his uh, his label or um, or Puffy's label rather. Uh, so here we go. So uh, from Brooklyn, uh, let's keep moving uh, forward here. Obviously, why he's called uh, Biggie, you guys can read that on your own time. 
so this is all about how he started rapping. Um, so how did he meet uh, Puffy here? Uh, so th this this is interesting for any musician. How do you how do you get to a point where you're hanging out with the guy that is founding the record label? You know, um, so he was really not making serious plans. It seems you know, he was having fun. He was rapping over beats, and that's an important lesson too. If you're just doing music because you think you're going to make money and you think you're going to be the next Biggie Smalls, this might not be the business for you. It has to start from a place of, of having fun and just doing it because you enjoy doing it. Um, so, so here we go. So he, he's invited to record with unsigned rappers. Um, and his recording uh, came to the attention of Puffy. All right. Now, Puffy actually was, was an intern at another uh, record label here, Uptown Records, and he decided to found his own label. So another little, uh, little bonus lesson for you guys. Uh, found your own label. If nobody's giving you a shot and nobody's sticking their neck out for you. Especially if you're an, inter you're an unpaid intern. Learn all the tricks and just do it yourself. Yeah, exactly. At the end. There's no like college degree that you can go to. There's no online course that you can go to that's going to teach you how to do it. You have to just sort of start and get involved in the business as and far as i know there's not like a labor union where you could where you start your own production <laughs> company to make music and people and you're able to you know get into the conglomerate and have like a pension plan and everything so you might as well just do it yourself and do it privatized there you go that's that's exactly right um it's one of the last beautiful examples of capitalism left <laughs> and and if puffy had never went out on a limb and started his own label we might have never heard of biggie smalls before Absolutely. Uh, so it, it's it's important that, that guys do this kind of stuff uh, and don't be afraid to, to go in and start competing in the business on the higher levels. Um, so let's let's skip ahead here a little bit more. He's doing some collaborations. Uh, he released the single. Um, and let's move ahead. Uh, Big in Tupac's friendship. That's that's pretty well documented. Um, his album starts to take off here. And uh, let's see, let's see. This uh, is where we get into uh, what was going on in um, Christopher Wallace, Biggie Smalls' family life at the time, where he found out that he was that his uh, that he was about to be a father. Right, and it's it's kind of uh, cool here that that they say. Um, I think this is Puffy uh, talking here. He says. Um, Suicidal thoughts sounded like a cry for help. In street life, you're not allowed to show if you care about something. So as he says right here, you've got to keep that straight face. The flip side of that is this album. He's giving up all his vulnerability. Yeah. Another little bonus lesson for you guys there. Uh, don't put on a face. Don't put on a front. Uh, while all the other rappers are talking about how hard they are and how they don't care about nothing, here comes Biggie. Uh, with like the polar opposite, he's he's trying to make some more emotional, uh, musical kind of statements with this record. Um, so here, let's keep going. Although he here. did it, he did it with the same st like straight gangsta face that all the other guys were doing, but with a much different premise. Not not something as you know, uh, premise of nah. I'm this is what I came from, and this is what I'm trying to be. Right. Uh, so it's 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 just important to have a story when when you're when you're a composer or songwriter or whatever. Uh, keep keep that context. Give your listeners that context. Um, so we have the death of Tupac here, um, and then well, there's there's where he died. I think I must have skipped over this. Where where did it happen here? Um, here's uh, here's here's him uh, hanging out with R. Kelly down here. Um, I should have like highlighted that quote exactly. Um, let's see, let's see, where was it? Where was it? I think it might be around here somewhere. Uh, Ready to Die album, and then just skim through, skim through. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, okay, we read to the end of that. F fill up some time here while I fi <laughs> find this quote well, What quote are you looking for here? Well, I'm looking for the part where he's actually having the conversation with, uh, with, with Combs. Um, so that is... Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. So this is where he, um, he gets arrested. Oh, is this the right arrest? So what I'm, where I'm looking for is the spot where he starts selling drugs again after he's had some success. Uh, in the in the music business, wow, it was only really minor success. I mean, it was time. it was he, he was you know essentially uh, 
starting to gain fame, but he hadn't he had yet to collect the paycheck from it. So it was it was before before he was able to truly see uh what benefits he was going to be able to reap with uh his newfound profession. Um but the one thing about what he was doing before which was flipping drugs, he he knew for a fact he could get he could flip some coin very very fast. And when you're trying to start a, when you're trying to start a family and you're trying to think about the expenses, he wasn't wrong uh, from a money standpoint, but uh, Puffy stepped in and was just speaking on the longevity of his family. Like the way the way that he was going to be able to support his family properly and without him going to jail or get or unfortunately getting shot, which is what ended up happening um, through something unrelated would would be to legitimately pursue his music career. And so this is where we're left right here. Where, this is what he's he's struggling with. He's he's sort uh, of in found between. It. Yeah. So he's in between these two lives. So his former life as this sort of gangster drug dealer guy um and keep in mind that that's sort of uh the central uh, kind of theme to his music as well. So he's not thinking of it as, oh, that was the, my previous life and now I want this new life. It's all kind of tied together here. But in retrospect, we can look back and see that he's he's really trying to do what he can uh, to, to uh, elevate himself to a position where he doesn't have to resort to the same old tricks. Um, so right around the time he has uh, his, his daughter here, um, He's concerned about money because he became a father uh, to Tiana, his daughter, with high school sweetheart Jan. Uh, it's been reported that Biggie went back to drug dealing at this point until Combs learned what he was up to and made him stop. All right. So that's the point right here that kind of ties this to the lot story. Um, we have Biggie in this life of, uh, I guess you could call it debauchery. Uh, he's confronted with a choice that he has to make in a situation. He has to react properly in the situation with his new record label, with his new deal here, with his, with his manager and stuff. He has to react. He has to stop uh, engaging in certain things so that he can get to that next level, so that he can save his own music career. And that's what this show is all about. Uh, so I, I finally found uh, the needle in the haystack of this biography and we're going to take it back to our beautiful FaceTime and finish up the rest of this discussion here. And here we go. Oops, here we go. All right. Um, so that's, that's Biggie and Puffy. And again, this relates to Lot. Again, similar situation. He was confronted with a situation. He had to do what's right in order to get out of that. So in, instead of going down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole here, because we, we know that there's a lot of questions about uh, Biggie's uh, being shot and all of that, uh, we're going to examine some of the more bigger picture stuff here. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to talk about here is uh, the difference between the old life, so to speak, and the new life, and how that can apply to musicians today watching this podcast. And this is all about potential, okay? So you have to show that you have potential. And this was a point that you actually brought up about um, Lot having the potential, not that he's perfect right now and that he already has achieved this huge success. He has the potential to do great things. He's shown his track record, he's shown that he's probably. You know he's done comparatively good speak comparatively he speaking to do good things Com now that now that 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 entire concept is, is it's comparatively speaking so uh lot showed greater potential as a human being than the other citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, which right. is not a very high bar I mean <laughs> exactly. the bar was set pretty low pretty pretty in the filth um but at the same the, the now when it comes this does this does relate to musicianship and uh, artistry in the sense that uh, you know there's there's hundreds of thousands of guys who are coming out with their their next mixtape their next their next CD um, 
you know, I, I've literally seen guys at gas stations handing handing out their mixtapes for free for donations. And yes, that is that is the way that is that that is the way to go to to a degree. You know, it, it, it gets your name out there and shows some heart. Um, but at the end of the day, talent speaks for itself. Potential speaks for itself. Uh, Lot, his talent spoke for itself in the way that he did something uh, seemingly selfless um, in order to uh, keep these angel the 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 angel scouts out of harm's way. Uh, in the same respect, um, the notorious B.I.G. He showed potential in the sense that he painted such a uh, disturbingly accurate picture of uh the lifestyle that he was coming from to get into uh the artistry game and but at the same time also uh showed a little bit of humanity in the sense that uh even in in, in a lot of in some of his lyrics stating that he did not want uh his future family uh his current family to end up becoming a statistic. He wanted to make sure that his people were looked out for. Um, he wanted to do good things with his life. He didn't want to just be a statistic or a product of his environment. And Lot was, that's, that, that is where it relates to Lot in the same way. Uh, Lot was not a product of his environment. He was, but he wasn't. He did great. He, he did. He, well, he did, stood out from the crowd. He stood yeah. out from the crowd in the same way that Christopher Wallace did. There you go. And and I keep saying, I say there you go after every single thing. I got to stop doing that. See, this is me showing vulnerability on camera, just like Biggie showed uh, vulnerability on his album. Yeah, what are you doing, man? Come on. <laughs> All right, so cut the camera off. Okay, so uh, potential, right? So Cast shut down now. So here's the thing about potential. Potential is not going to get you there by itself. Potential doesn't mean you have the potential to be superstar uh, you know, like you're going to start a band and it's going to turn into Maroon 5. It's going to turn into the, the Rolling Stones. That's not what we're saying here about potential. Uh, I think it's more about you have to uh, sort of uh, keep a keep a keep a record of where you've been, where you're where you are now and where you want to go. And that's what both Lot and Biggie were doing as they moved along and progressed through their lives they're always keeping track they're always keeping tabs and they're always acting uh, a different way than you would expect in each situation so that's potential it's not going to guarantee success it's absolutely not but if you don't have that potential first you're probably going to guarantee that you won't achieve success so it's one of these weird backwards catch 22s where you got to have one to get the other one but just having it is not going to guarantee that you get it uh so there's potential uh back then versus nowadays um another uh way that this applies specifically to biggie in terms of potential is that biggie uh, was was shot when he was like what thirty? He was or twenty. Something? No, he, he was, was twenty four. Yeah, he was twenty four. He was he was, he was very young, and he only had a few really good solid years in the music business, and he's still regarded as like a lot of people will regard him as the best rapper of all time, uh, or at least in most people's top three, top five. He always yeah. So he's he's. Now we look back on his very short track record and say, well, he's the best and he's 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 just magic because he's just the greatest guy. But what we don't understand is when Biggie was in his life and he was living it, he was on the inside of it. He was never really thinking of it that way. How could he? He he wasn't there to experience the, you know, 20, 30 some years after his death where his music continues to grow and grow and grow and grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger uh just just like biggie himself right okay so he he's, he was never able to really fully grasp that so it's it's just important to realize that even when he's going to meetings with with puffy he's at a very low level probably in his mind as far as the uh, large spectrum of the music career as big of a man uh, uh, as he business. was as as big of a man as he was he was a little fish in a big pond at that point in exactly time. um so he was he was not very humbling yet. concept 
And it's just amazing to see the kind of moves and the kind of attitude that the guy had uh, even before he achieved this like level of success. He was always like super humble about it. Now, I don't know if that would have been true if he would have like lived to see, you know, his his thousand number one hits and all that. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe he would have delved into excess. Maybe he wouldn't have. But, but the fact of the matter is what he did when he was alive in his short time was something right. And he started a scene. He started a movement. This hip hop thing wasn't that big until big made it big. Um, and and Tupac, other guys start coming in. There's guys on on both coasts now of 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 the country, and it evolves into this huge thing. Now, some would argue, and we're getting a little conspiratorial, but some would okay. argue that the whole East Coast West Coast feud was an entire conspiracy concocted a fabricated by the construct. Media. Right. It, well, people argue that it's concocted by the media and the record label so that they could increase their sales. Uh, probably seeing the writing on the wall as far as there's something as to be said for that. I mean, there, downloads go. Yes, um, there's something to be said for that. So for whether sure. it was planned or not, it absolutely had that effect. But but the potential was still there at the at the very beginning, and this is what w what most people would still listen to and regard as the golden age of hip hop and it's a very small amount of time. So he was able to not only save his career when he was alive, but moreover, he was able to carve his reputation into uh, music history uh, forever, for all of eternity. You're never gonna forget about Biggie Smalls. Not at all. Um, just like we don't forget about a lot of the important stories in the Bible. Um, so that's Biggie Smalls, uh, that's potential. Um, another issue getting into uh, his uh, eventual uh, uh, untimely demise. You got to watch your language on these platforms now. Um, it, it, another issue with, with, with that is, you know, how, as a musician today, what can we really learn from his death and what can we learn from the progress that he made prior to his death? Right. Leading up to that. And how can we maybe apply some of these uh, concepts uh, in, in our lives and in our careers? Uh, one thing I remember we were reading on that biography earlier is about how, uh, how like stoic and relaxed and, and professional he was in his first meeting with Puffy. Well, it actually, that? It, it, yes, I do. And it actually kind of goes back to uh, one of the things that we were talking about in one of our previous uh, casts uh, where uh, we were talking about the warrior's mentality of um of like like fasting like uh, how 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 you've worked with certain musicians and and I I am one of these musicians like uh don't don't eat before a show uh go go into battle hungry yeah. that kind of stuff um th the one thing that really stuck out to me um when we were reading that biography uh, researching for this was about how uh Puffy when he met him at the soul food restaurant. It was a it was a soul food restaurant in New York that was so well renowned for its soul food and and, and here here is this oh, obese local mm -hmm. who clearly has eaten at this restaurant before um, meeting him in there and as soon as they walk in Puffy asks you know do do you want to get something to eat and whatnot and uh, uh, Christopher Wallace says no I'm good and he. That that really stuck out to Puffy too, because he was like, "Man, this guy is really in this moment right now. He wants to make an impression so bad. He wants he wants to be taken seriously so much that he's not going to be the fat kid eating in the restaurant when we're about to sit here and talk business. We're here to talk business. We're going to talk business, and he wants right. to talk business." Puffy was very much impressed by that, by by the way that he put that air off about him. Yeah, I mean, you know, big guys like to eat. And it's it's like he's putting that off for later, and he's saying, "No, this is more important right now." And not that if you meet with a A and R, uh, such a simple <laughs> moment to read way too much into. Yeah, but like, but at the same time, it does it, it does say something. Well, if you go to a meeting at a restaurant with an A and R executive or something, it's like uh, we're not saying just don't eat, and that you're gonna you're gonna get a record deal out of it. But it's, I think, an example of the guy's mentality and how he was able to prioritize certain things 
over other things. And so that's important. And, and so let's move forward a little bit in time to not speculating about uh, the death, but maybe speculating a little bit about uh, if, if we're in a similar situation as far as uh, beef and drama goes with other musicians, because you know it happens all the time. Uh, we did a whole segment on that on our very first episode about band drama. And, you know, I'm not saying that there was a drama that resulted in the murder or, or whatever. Uh, you can you can research that and figure out and go, you know, make your own yeah, assessments as far as that goes. Exactly. But but as far as avoiding drama and some some strategies to facilitate that, uh, one thing I can think of especially in the DMV. A lot of musicians around here are very exclusive, and this is not just a uh, you know, drummer you or a rapper or singer phenomena. It happens from, uh, from the venue, club owners, all the way down to the, the lowly sound guys and roadies. Yes. Yeah. They, they can be very exclusive. You know, they, they want to only work with certain people. They don't want to uh, help out the younger guys. They don't want to give an opportunity because I guess they see that as weakness or selling out or something. I don't really know. Um, but one of the most important things that we can do as musicians and artists is reach out to the younger guys and do a lot of mentoring, a lot of teaching, uh, a lot of stuff like we're doing right now. We're putting this content out there. And we don't know that it's going to help anybody or that it's going to help us or we're going to get any clicks or views. But we know it's it. not going to hurt anybody. <laughs> right. We're, we're, we're just putting it out there for the few people that might find something like this interesting. And I got to say, like, I would have loved to see some videos like this when I was just getting started out uh, playing music and, and learning about the business and, and more importantly, uh, the mentality of things, because everybody says in, in music game, you know, be a people person. You got to be good working with people. Well, what does that really mean? It means to me uh, two two things. Sometimes it's working with people that you can't even see, <laughs> like like we're doing right now. Exactly. So, but 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 to me, it's about working with people that are like above you, that are higher level, not getting starstruck, not being a bootlicker. But but being able to work with them and not like make it awkward. And so getting along with yep. people that are on a higher level than you is so, so, so important. Uh, a lot of guys will try to show off. Um, and, and I remember uh, um, coming back from the NAM show, we were on the plane and there's Dennis Chambers sitting right next to me. I was like, you know, Dennis, what, what advice do you have for some uh, up and coming musicians? And what he was talking about is guys want to keep showing off. He said, stop all the showing off, all the showboating. Uh, and he told a story about a drummer that came up on a very high profile gig for like Shaka Khan or something. He does all this fancy show off stuff. And then Shaka was like, well, that's going to be this drummer's last night. And so that's that's is that being a people person? I don't know. Like it, it's you know, it, it just as important learning how to play the song right and knowing how to not step on the other band members as it is to know how to actually talk to people and make eye contact and 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 be on a one-on-one -on -one type of relationship so not only for the higher level guys but but also uh it's important for me especially as a teacher to do mentoring and uh bring young people in uh you do collaborations with guys that you know, have uh, lower profiles or smaller profiles, smaller followings. Um, don't only do that <laughs> because you can end up wasting a lot of time on a lot of guys that right. really don't have a lot of potential. Uh, but, we, but with the exception of that caveat, I say it's important for everybody to reach out. And, and, and again, I don't want to make definitive statements here, but uh, tie, tying it back to the Biggie story, uh, you don't know how many different feuds and how many different uh, uh, beefs and, and drama issues were, were happening between Biggie and the other guys in that scene. And I think it's important for us nowadays to take a lesson from that and say, look, it's important to mentor the young guys so that they don't feel like you're trying to cut them out. You're trying to step on them. You're trying to like prevent them or, or like compete with them or like compete them. So out of the basically market. look at, look at, look out for your, your green, your green guys. Your look out for your green guys because yeah. they, they are in fact going to be your predecessors. Right. Or you, you're, you're their predecessors. I'm sorry. I, I'm getting that a little bit backwards, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. They're, they're going to eventually take, uh, you know, take, take the, the scepter. 
and you don't like if you're scared of that if you're scared of the next generation then the next young guy and we've talked and about fear before you, as well and yeah. that that's a thing uh, yeah that's that's an inevitability and there's going to be a, a, a there is going to be an elemental factor of you being afraid to to take to take the spotlight from the guy who is mentoring you or whatever but go no uh you know there's it's it it it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a little bit of a dance that you got to do it's not it doesn't happen overnight um, but it also doesn't take a thousand years, you know, you just kind of, you, you got to work, work with your mentors. And if you are somebody who is, uh, a seasoned musician or somebody like that, or a performer, then when you're working with a new up and comer, you know, have a little bit of patience. Like the, 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 the new up and comer has to have patience and the mentor also has to have an equal amount of patience, yeah, if it, not more. It, it drives me crazy when guys and producers and engineers and stuff, they'll have like this super ridiculously high bar of like what's acceptable. Uh, and, and you're working with like some of these guys are recording these young kids and stuff. It's like you, you can't just hold everybody to the same standard. If you're working with somebody that's just getting started, you got to work with them on the level that they're at a little bit. And I think that's so important in establishing yourself as a higher level guy uh, is so important to reach out to the lower level guys and establish that and, and show them some of your tricks and give them. Uh, some of the techniques that you use to get to where you're at. Um, and I got just one quick story on that. Um, one of my students uh, kind of came from a little bit of a, uh, uh, I guess you could say, underprivileged uh, sort, Dicey of, background. sort of background childhood. Right. Uh, tumultuous family life and all that. Um, and the, the, the grandmother wanted to sign this young man up for piano lessons. And I've been teaching this kid for years and years and years. Um, and so he's like, I guess, sort of uh, passionate about the piano and all that. Uh, but what really, like I saw a major shift in this young man. And all it took was this, because where I teach is also uh, where I have my studio A, my main uh, recording studio. And he had like wrote some lyrics or something. And I was like, hey, you know, finish it up. Keep, keep writing it. And we, we talked a little bit about rhyme schemes and all that. I don't want to make it into a lyrical lesson, but long story short, he at, uh, ended up coming up with some nice lyrics. It's probably like his first song that he ever wrote, so nothing special. But like for me, as the a proudest moment that that uh, I mean, when you're when when you're first starting to write and you actually complete a finish project, something. it's it's oh yeah, fin finishing something. I mean, that's that that is like the ultimate high for real. So for me, as an older guy in the music business, at the teaching level and the performance and the songwriting and publishing level. Uh, you know, what point is there for me to like hold this kid's song to like this super high, you know, level and start picking it apart and like, you know, punching down and, and taking his whole creation apart. It's like, I kind of would rather encourage him to do what he's going to do and, and help him realize these lessons on his own. And so this is my job as a producer. I don't care what level people are at. I kind of treat them all as if they're babies you don't want to drop your baby you know you don't want to do that uh, pretty much if you don't like keep track of what they're doing and encourage them in the right direction uh your baby is is gonna die so you got to take it's care gonna of them. die you got to take care of them you're not you can't just be mean and just be like no baby like Psh. right uh, so now we're gonna get uh, demonetized <laughs> for violence violence against children um, babies so, specifically so yeah just to wrap infants. the story up so i took him into the uh, studio got the mic set up he's he, you know give me some auto tune and put some reverb on it and uh, you know put a real makeshift beat together this was in maybe 10 15 minutes at the end of the kid's lesson uh which i was not getting paid for he's probably astounded by i mean how quickly you probably put something together well he doesn't know he just expects he, he doesn't what know saying. what to expect because yeah. he's never been in an actual studio recording in a professional setting before and so he was in the booth with the headphones and it was like real for him and we recorded his song and and you know i'm gonna do a little mix for him and send it to him but so rather than me just sit there and try to you know uh, play a bunch of mind games with him over the lyrics uh, and and the the number of syllables in the quatrain. I'd rather just record the thing and have him really be proud of it, and then listen to it, 
And then I guarantee you when he goes and listens to an actual professional song, he'll start comparing in his mind and say, okay, well, here's what I wrote. Now, here's an actual professional guy that did it. How can I get closer to that? And so you're not going to be able to like shame somebody into realizing that. Well, especially because there's two sides of that coin, especially when you're coming out with a with a, a, a new piece of material. Um, I feel like there's um, there are times when you come out with something that you don't really necessarily have. Like like this kid, this kid sounds like like he he wrote these lyrics and he had a little bit of a beat and everything like that, but he didn't necessarily uh, think that it was going to be something that he was going to be proud of with the finished product until he recorded it with you. So he didn't expect anything out of that. He got more than he expected. Now, in the same fashion, um, and the more that you do this, the more that you will realize that this does, that this will happen to you, sometimes you will also, that will be in reverse. You will have something that when you, when it, the, the second you write it, you think that it's fire, you think that it's great, and then you start working with it a little bit and you realize, oh man, unfortunately, this is not as good as I, I thought <laughs> as I thought it was when I first put pen to paper or when I first came up with this beat or it's too much like this or it's never going to fit in with this, that or the other thing. So it ends up being not as good as you thought it was going to be, but that's not that's nothing that's nothing to be discouraged about. In fact, I would I would posit that uh it w it should be more of a motivator because if you if you have something where it turns out to from the initial startup not be as great as you thought it was immediately well now you have something to work with mold it a little bit every piece of every piece of uh like content that you come out with is something that you need to mold um some Gotta things start are somewhere some you know? things are easier to mold than others yeah, my trick for that is just if it ain't working and it ain't feeling right, that it goes on the back shelf. Yep, <laughs> for very some of them and forever. If, if later, <laughs> if later something, I've had, I've, I'm, I've certainly had times where I've, I've written a lyric for a song that I was writing, and I end up scrapping everything that I wrote around just that one lyric, but I still like that lyric. So I keep that one and everything else, but everything else had to change. So that's what it's all about. It was still worth writing all of that garbage around that lyric because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to write the good stuff around it the second time around. You know, maybe one of these days we should do a show about lyrics specifically because I, I I thought it would be well, funny to I, show. No, well, if, I don't know if you have these, but I have lyrics. Believe it or not, we talk about what we're going to do before we before we start doing this. Yeah, so it looks like we it looks like we just set ourselves up to get that done. Well, here. just to just to just to pitch it. <laughs> not a now, bit but here. next time. But I don't know about you, but I have these lyric sheets where I like to write them out by hand, and by the end, by the time the song is done. There's arrows and crosses and exclamation points and little skulls and crossbones. Just it, it's it's a mess. But that's like the creative process. Uh, it it's not like oh we're gonna do A B C and then we're done. Uh, it's very much like now we're backtracking a little bit and fixing what came before. Um, I think it was Steven Tyler um, from Aerosmith who uh, I I listened to some. He was he was getting interviewed by somebody and. Um, he was saying something about how uh, when it comes to the songwriting process, sometimes you have like you have a, a multitude of different ways that new songs will come about. Sometimes you'll have uh, you'll be trying to write something new and the only thing you got is a nugget and that nugget is that nugget is nice and you start writing around the nugget and then you have other times where uh, you have a bunch of just different nuggets from different things and then one day you just decide screw it i'll go ahead and take the nuggets and work them into each other and you put all the nuggets together and then there are other times where you'll have something where the entire body of the work that you're trying to come out with is a nice little nugget but there's a there's a piece in there that needs to be taken out i mean i wrote this whole song and all i got this little space for one little nugget i wonder where i could Right. Just slide it right in there. Or I wrote all I wrote all of this stuff, but it seems a little bit busy. Maybe if I take out just this one piece, now it's a little bit less busy. It's a little bit more listenable. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's. I mean, that again, this this kind There's of different stuff, approaches. This kind of stuff will open your mind if you are writing music, like because when I went to write my, like my latest phase of songs, I was obsessing over how to get better at writing songs and I did a bunch of Google searches and every search that I made uh, just made me more and more confused and so it's it's important to just realize that there is no right way to do this stuff what like whatever way got you to the end of the song that's the right way and don't question it and like I'll start things completely different ways depending on what it is and there's no rhyme or reason to it um, but uh, getting uh, it, guiding us a little back uh, toward the topic here so we can uh, conclude uh, this this amazing content for tonight. Um, mentoring uh, younger folks it was the very last point here. Well, how do you how do you do that? How do you try uh, or or do you lead well, first by example? Off, first off, I don't. But I mean, that's not it's not something well, you have younger people. It's like not something that I brother. actively do. You got a um, younger brother, you know, younger guys and younger people. Yes, yes, but I'm... Uh, uh, so, like, how do you convey to them some of these truths without being, like, a preachy, like, big-brained, like, like loser, you know? Well, you never... Well, the one thing that I will say is ne never never be... Do not be pushy with uh, <laughs> your ideals. Um, the... the I, I, f I feel like the best way to mentor in any, in any way, shape, or form on any subject is, um, like, let's say it's... For, for example... Let's say it's a musician. Um, if you have if you have ideas about like um, the on, the only the only reason that you're going that you're going to have uh, ideas and editations of how they're of how they're running their game is by listening to them tell you about how they're currently running their game. Yeah. So if you have so if, if if I'm if I'm talking to uh, somebody. Um, and, and I've, I've, I've run into a, f a few musicians here and there and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm recording this, that, or the other thing. Um, and honestly, the best way to connect is to ask questions, ask them questions first. Don't do not necessarily start by saying, oh, well, I hope you're not doing this. <laughs> I hope yeah. you're not doing it this way. Cause if you're doing it this way, it's wrong. You, you got to start from a point of. Well, how are you doing it? Are you doing it like this? Because I've done it that way before. Did it, and it, it didn't work for me, but did it work for you? Because sometimes the thing that worked for me might not work for them, and sometimes the thing that didn't work for me does work for them. Like it, it's yeah, people just do stuff, and you don't know if it worked or not. Like one of the things you'll see a lot of videos about on YouTube. Well, there's is, a lot of and, Facebook well, there's ads. A lot of mus there's a lot of music people stuff that say, is formula based. People say musicians should take out. A bunch of Facebook ads and and say, hey, if you like John McLaughlin, then you're gonna love my other crazy jazz fusion group and put a two minute ad out there, and you're gonna get a million clicks from Facebook ads. Uh, and you you will get some clicks from Facebook ads, but you're not gonna get any engagement. You're not gonna get people actually commenting on it and saying, hey, not know, at where, all. Where no. can I buy the CD? Where? Can, how can I give you some money? And so you've spent money. You've maybe created some brand awareness there. You spent money asking for money. Right, which is not a, a good way to do it. And you're trying to like break even by like spending $1,000 on an ad and then you think you're going to sell $1,000 worth of CDs just off of that ad. Um, the guys you bought the ad space from are real happy with you, yeah, but you're like, not going to be happy with the results of you purchasing that you know, ad space. I got a message from Facebook the other day that said, hey, you haven't boosted any posts in a while. Here's a $10 credit. Yeah, you're right. I haven't. <laughs> yeah, it's like, all right, yeah, let me use your little $10 uh, credit and get five clicks on, on, on my page. Like, that's going to do something. No, nah, um, I'm good. Yeah, I'd miss say, me with that. I'd say take your money and invest it in like uh, you know some nice monitor speakers, or like invest it in a nice big notepad where you can write some some really good songs. Um, but so anyway, that's that's mentoring. It's it's great that you have that uh, that that uh, view that asking questions rather than preaching to people, and that's what we want to do here, right? You can't teach if you haven't learned. Now, yeah, now we don't. We can't really ask questions in real time. Now, if we had some people uh, in the chat 
we'll we get could there. do that. We could do that, and Have we faith, can, brother. We can, we can answer back and forth to you in real time. Um, but we can ask some questions now to our our lovely uh, uh, viewers here, and maybe they can leave some comments down below, and then we can keep the conversation going. All right. Well, first off, the the thing. Uh, Owen certainly mentions this every time, so I'm just going to start with this. Uh, please get on here, watch watch our cast, and disagree with us. Start there. Start there. Let's 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 get a dialogue going in some fashion. Um, and trust me, it's something uh, where um, your your feedback it will be mentioned in future broadcasts. So that's we'll just start there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did a whole stream uh, responding to people's comments. Um, but so on on this topic, though, oh yeah, you did do that. Yeah. That's so right. on, on this topic, uh, how we did, do we did you? A whole, we did a whole podcast about yeah. about a, a, a ranty email. <laughs> so so it, so you guys out there, right? Here's 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 question of the day number one. Question of the day number one is this: How do you increase your potential? What do you do? What are you? What action are you actually taking right now that is demonstrating and proving to the world that you have the potential that we're talking about here? What are you actually doing? Because everybody says, "Oh, I have potential." They have potential, but you have to prove that to the world. That's not my job to say you have potential. That's your job. You have to convince us. So, what are you doing, if anything? Uh, and side question: If you're not doing anything to prove that, what are you, what are you doing? You know, you you have to be doing something, even if you just write one song. That's potential. You could write one song and have a hit. It's probably not likely. A lot of the guys that have hit songs on the radio now have written hundreds and thousands of songs, but everybody has to start somewhere. So, what have you done to take a step in that direction? Question today number two. Who have you mentored? Are you a music teacher? Are you uh, taking lessons from a music teacher? Do you support music lessons? Or are you one of these guys that's like, oh, I just teach myself and that's all I do. And, you know, I don't want to teach anybody my tricks because they're so good and cutting edge. Who, like, how do you make it work? <laughs> you know, how, how do you make that work? How do you how do you deal with that? How do you deal with uh, arguing with snobs? My that's tricks a, are so good. <laughs> yeah, they're so good. You can't. No, a lot of a lot of gospel uh, organ guys. I, I know like exactly the, what you're saying. No, these, no, no, no. These no, no, gospel trust guys me. will actually cover up their keyboard when they're at church so people can't take their phone and, and steal their chords. Oh man, if he saw what I was doing with this chord, <laughs> yeah. Dude, yeah, no, you. I'm you telling you, it's revolutionary. You it's never been done this before, chord. dude. This chord is just going to open up a black hole and just transport you to another. Time I threw dimension. a sixteenth note in here that's going to blow your mind, dude. You heard flat elevens before, right? But you ain't heard this flat. 11 you ain't heard before. flat twelves. You don't know nothing about that. <laughs> oh god i could do that i could i could riff on this all yeah day. dude hey you know <laughs> d no my secret chord is take a flat 12 and a sharp 11 at the same time oh man that that there's a little musician joke for you all right anyway uh so th i those don't get are, it but okay <laughs> You're a bass player. You don't have to get it. I don't. That's true. Uh, uh, you just play the root notes. That's all. That's all you're good for. Um, but so that is. You see how he show. diminishes my talent. <laughs> He's terrible. No respect at all. No respect. Uh, so that's the show for today. That's all we got for you. Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot. Nothing special about the guy. He had potential. Uh, you know, he I guess mentored his his daughters to you know be real friendly to the strangers of the town. And uh, Biggie Smalls is uh, the greatest rapper alive, and we're East Coast guys, so we, we can say that and not feel like we're offending people. Um, so that is the show. And that being said, in the immortal words of Boston, don't look back. <laughs> exactly. Do not look back. Uh, and and definitely don't look back as you're clicking the subscribe button right underneath my finger right here somewhere no, right around here. there no it's going to be right around there here over there is going to be the like here? button no this is going to be the like button over there so the subscribe button is yeah, here this is the subscribe button right there right here yeah yeah Cl here. close enough all right right there all right it's there. big and red and rectangular if you can't find it without uh, you know with with our uh, amazing directions yeah, maybe maybe find another video. Uh, so yeah, hit the like, subscribe, leave us a comment down below. The questions of the day, uh, hit the like if you like. 
Uh, make sure to share this video with all your friends and family. Let them know that you discovered this great uh, podcast and it's wholesome for the family here on YouTube, for the little kids over here on YouTube. Uh, there is no kids be watching this because it's YouTube. That's true. That's this fair. kid. This, yeah, that, give you that's that. basically little kid uh, land right there. Uh, so, so, um, I just, I just, I just lost it. Yeah, uh, anyway, did. we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the show right here. Uh, we'll see you guys on episode five next week ish, maybe. Um, and also leave us a comment if you like our beautiful threads today. And we will see y'all on the next cast. Peace out.